Welcome to a video review for a solitaire game in the States of Siege series from White Dog Games called Nubia, Egypt's Black Heirs. The game is designed by Ben Madison, and I know that credit is given to Wes Ernie uh, for development of the game as well. So the game is a little bit off the beaten path of normal games that I think I normally play or even most of us normally play, but I think that's a good thing. The game also deals with some issues, uh, which I, I actually appreciate about Ben Madison, that he's willing to look at these issues, such as slavery um, and how it's used by uh, these kingdoms uh, in, in ancient, not ancient, but in, in the African continent. So this game, it basically covers the year 1100 through about 1500 AD and looks at the Nubian kingdom, which is the old kingdom of Cush, which is what it used to be known by. Uh, Nubia is situated on the southern uh, end of the Nile, and the Egyptians are on the northern end as it flows into the Mediterranean. As you know, the, the, the uh, Nile flows south to north, but these two kingdoms competed. They also, in the end, I, I think assisted each other. They were kind of the two points along that Nile River that traded with each other and traded with other kingdoms. The game also, during this period of time, Nubia is a Christian kingdom, meaning they have adopted Christianity, uh, the Coptic faith, and they are uh, practicing Christians, not, uh, not pagans or nor Muslim, but Christians. So in essence, the game sets it up such that you are fighting against the encroachments of various uh, Muslim states as well as various pagan states who are trying to move into your territory, the king of, of Nubia, and take over, dominate you. The game is a states of series game. As you can see from the map, we'll, we'll go over this here in just a minute. There are five different tracks that all converge on this central point, which is the city, the capital city of Soba. If a unit ever, ever gets in there and you fail what is called a, a crisis check, you lose the game. In this game, I have set it up. I've played through it. I actually got, there are 27 cards or 27 turns in the game. And I think there were. So on the 24th turn, I succumbed to the Jod Mech uh, from the north, which came from Path A, and they invaded Soba and I failed the crisis check. So the game ended. Um, I didn't win. I've now played this game four times, and I've only won once. So the game is a little tough. Uh, lots of elements that just seem to suck the wind out of your sails, that when you lose certain things, or you don't gain these feudal tokens that gain you, gain you bonuses when you attack your advancing enemies, you know, when you can't get those things, you just can't do anything. The other thing that I really enjoy about this game, and I'll talk about it when we look at the cards, is that traditionally in a States of Siege game, the actions in this game, they're referred to as efforts. But the efforts or your actions uh, normally come from a card. So your card might say you have three efforts this turn. Um, in this game, your efforts come from two different things, and then you can supplement them to get more options and more efforts. And there comes a time where you're, you're literally going to have to do that because you've just drawn the wrong king or the wrong uh, metropolitan bishop, and you don't have other resources, and you've got you to gotta get a couple things done. You always have to get a couple things done each turn, but there will be times where you won't be able to do that. So there's other ways to get efforts or actions uh, you can do many different things. We'll talk about those here in just a second. Uh, but once again, the game basically, 27 cards. Each of those cards represent approximately 14 years in this history. Uh, you're going to play through those actions. Here, let's go ahead and look at a card. And keep in mind that this card is near the end. Ignore the number. The number is just there so you can keep track of them. Like I said, 1 to 27. They're going to be randomized and shuffled. There are three different types of cards. There's a green, there's a tan, and a red. 
The green cards are your starting six cards. The tan cards are kind of the middle, I want to say it's 14 cards. And then the red cards, which get a lot more difficult, are the last eight or nine cards. So once again, you've got a historic title. Then you've got this historic information that really has no bearing upon the game, but you can read it to learn. As I've mentioned before, many times I play these games not only to enjoy them, relive history and try to do better than historically, but also like to learn. So this one, you're going to learn a lot about the kingdom of Nubia. Then at the top, you're going to literally follow these actions from top to bottom, left to right. So if this is the card that we're, we're going to draw, I'll go through this right now. These stars are called special events. This one says Ethiopians. What you're going to do, you're going to read the rule book. You're going to look at the rule book and there's kind of a process. If on this path D, there is what is called a feudal token. And here I happen to have one. Unfortunately, when I... When I played the game, I did not have that. Sorry, I'm trying to get that focused in for you. This is like a, a local tribe or a local king or a local lord has joined with you and is providing their assistance to you as you fight it back that path's mech. Um, mech is a Nubian word for tribe or enemy uh, and is used throughout the game. But the Ethiopians, basically, you're going to look at this path, only path four, which is called path D. Four is the number, the dice number, when you randomly roll results. If that happens to be there, this Ethiopian token is going to then be put on there, and it's going to give you several benefits to fight back this tribe on this path. So that's a good one. It typically comes up in the last four, five, maybe six cards of the deck. And frankly, I've never received it. Never have I had a positive feudal token there when this event comes up. So then the next one is Coptic Pope. So what you're going to do, you're literally going to take your metropolitan, which is your local church representative, and you're going to take them, you're going to put them into a draw cup that has four total <coughs> of these metropolitans. You're going to randomly reach in and you're going to draw one out. So I drew, I drew the one that gives you one. It says Jesus on it. I, I'm not sure if that's referring to Jesus or uh, some other person, but you're going to place that there as part of that event. And then that, that Metropolitan is going to add your to your actions or your efforts, the number located on their, their counter. So they're going to give you one action or effort that turn. Go back to the card. Next is feudalism. Feudalism, you're going to roll a couple of dice. Your first dice, is, your first die is going to refer to the path number. One, two, so you got one, two, three, four, or five. So you're going to roll that and pick the path. Then the next die is going to determine the land that you're going to place one of these feudal markers in. Sobus counts as one. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. So you roll that die. Let's see, you roll the four. You're going to place here if there's not a feudal token already. And there's certain rules. If it's two positives, you're going to drive that path's mech back. If it's two negative, they're going to advance. Uh, if it's a negative and a positive, they're going to cancel each other out. But there can never be more than one feudal token per path. Um, so... That's the process called feudalism. What that does is it gives you positives or negatives on that track to use your efforts to drive back the mechs. Getting a positive one, the highest positive that you can get, can be extremely beneficial. If we look at these mechs real quick, and this is actually the updated version of the Jod, meaning this came in about halfway through the game. The other one is a four, and it's a different tribe, the Juhainya. So once it flipped from a four to a five, sorry, it became that much more difficult to defeat that tribe or mech. Uh, but you're going to use that to then take an effort to try to attack that. You're going to roll a six-sided die. You're hoping to get equal to or higher than uh, their, uh, their number there. 
So that, that's the way that works. But the feudal tokens can be good. They also can be bad. Uru. Uru is a word for king. You'll notice the crown there. So the same thing. You're going to take your Uru. And I happen to have, at the very end of that game, I had a very good Uru and it gave me four actions. You're going to drop that in the, in the draw cup and you're going to pull it out. Boom. I pulled it out. So I pulled out a two. He is now your Uru. So basically every 14 years, somebody has succeeded either through death, death in battle, death due to old age, or they fell out of favor and they were, they were replaced. The other thing I want to point out on this counter, you'll notice he has a blue stripe where he is named. This guy is named George. When he comes out, you have the option of removing negative uh, the negative uh, feudal tokens. So if these happen to be on these tracks and they're going to bug you, you, when he comes out, you have the benefit of removing those. There are also kings that have a blue and a brown stripe. That means you've got to remove all the feudal tokens, both the positive ones and the negative. That can be very damaging. So with that, you're going to see that I have two actions or efforts plus one from my Metropolitan for a total of three efforts this turn. That's not a lot. But remember I mentioned there are ways that you can gain more efforts. So real quickly, look here, you've got the bishops. You have three bishops to start the game. At any time, you can discard one of these bishops. They don't come back to gain one free action or effort. And we're going to go back to the card, so, so hold on, don't let me forget. But when you do that, you're going to have to randomly draw from the draw cup an Uru. And you're going to now have to place him in what is called the mosque bo box. That typically refers to the fact that he was, you know, any number of things. He was ousted from power. He was a heretic. He was not in favor with the people. He died. He had to leave. And you'll notice... In this box, now I have nine of those Urus. I don't have access to three or four very good Urus there that could help me get new actions, and I've lost them. I've lost them because of various things. Getting, uh, getting into Soba by one of the mechs, or I pulled one out to do the Crown Prince action and attack a, a mech and use their benefit or their number as a bonus to that combat, if you lose it, then they go away. If you win it, they stay and become the next Uru. So there are different things where you're going to lose that Uru. But that bishop's going to now give you one extra action. You can also do what's called a land sale. So you have four of these tokens. They're referred to as land sale tokens in your box here. You can discard one, and they have a three. that has a three on it. There are two threes, a four, and a two. And then you're going to reduce it by the Crusade level. The Crusade level is shown here on the map, and it occasionally comes up on a card. You're going to roll a die, and that's going to determine whether it's a 2, 1, or a 0. A 2 is bad for you because the Crusades are not going well. Most of the Muslims are no longer needed there, and they are going to start attacking you more. If it's a 1, they're having to pay attention, and if it's a 0, they cannot really bother you. Therefore, it doesn't affect you. The way the Crusade level affects you is if you discard a three, sorry, a three-numbered land sale token, you're going to have to reduce the Crusade level, and it's a two, so you're only going to gain a net one action. So what I try to do is I wait as long as I possibly can until that Crusade level is at a one or a zero. It, it's going to change three, maybe four times throughout the game, and it's pretty hard to do, frankly. So that's another way. You can also literally throw one of your princesses. You have six princesses. These are tiles that you can throw them to the wolves is what it's called. I think it probably refers to arranged marriage or political marriages where you're giving your, your, uh, the king's daughters over to another kingdom to improve relationships. You'll notice it has this effort symbol to the side. There's also a die symbol. Uh, and that's associated with the the dynastic marriage uh, dynastic marriage token. 
And then it also, if you do this throw to the wolves, it's going to affect you by reducing your kingship asset. We haven't talked about that yet by two. That can be very, very bad. But those can gain you three to six additional actions. You can also do the dynastic marriage. You're going to discard this token to get additional actions. You're going to throw it away into your dead pile. You're going to you're going to roll a die. I rolled a two. You're going to gain that number of action points. That number two will refer to one of these six things or princesses in your stack. If you have that princess in the stack that you just rolled, you have to get rid of that princess. So if you haven't gotten rid of the two, you now have to dig in there, get rid of the two with no uh, negative effect. That's the way you can modify your number of, of actions or efforts. And frankly, let me show you the Coptic, you know, the Coptic Pope action and your different metropolitans. Let me lay them out here in my hand. There are four of those in the draw pile, even this. So there's another one. So there are only four of those in that draw cup, a zero, one, or zero, two ones, and then a two. So as you draw those every time that Coptic Pope event comes up, you're hoping to get the number two action Metropolitan so he can help you the most. Doesn't always happen that way. It's a 25% to get him. 50% you're going to gain two of the one or one of the ones. And then 25% of the time you're going to get nothing. I seem to get the zero quite often. It's very, very upsetting. Um, but it's part of the game. It's the way that it was designed. And frankly, as I mentioned earlier, it's different. Typically, you get the number of efforts from a card. And I think that's a little easier to predict and in some ways to calculate. If there's eight or ten cards in an era, you're going to know, okay, there's three three actions, there's two two actions, there's four one actions, and one zero action you're going to kind of know and or expect what's coming up. This is always random, which is kind of cool. And furthermore, as you thin out your Urus, because you've used them in battle and lost, or there are crises going on and you have to lose one, you're hoping to get your zeros and your ones drawn out of your cup and placed here in the mosque, because that then makes the odds of getting your five, four, three, your couple of twos more than when there's a whole bunch of zeros and ones in there. So I really like that aspect of the design. So back to the card. So we've talked about actions where you get from your Uru and your uh, Metropolitan. Then you'll notice the next four, five icons are the down arrow. That means the mech or tribe on path A, B, D, and E are going to advance one space. So you can see this is a very bad card. You're literally going to have all of those paths advance and it can cause significant damage. You're also, and I haven't shown you yet, your royal assets down here at the bottom. We'll talk about that here just in a moment. But once again, those paths are going to move and, you know, it's not good that four are moving in one turn. Usually it's two, maybe three. This is a bad card because it has four. Then the next part is it says nobility is going to move down. So your royal assets are here. They are three elements that are key to your rule as king uh, in, in the game. You're actually playing as a vizier or a, 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 a like an assistant to the king. Um, you're not actually the king. So, But these are the assets you have to manage, your nobility, your kingship, and your army. And you have to make sure that those don't hit the zero level because if they hit the zero level, they will bring on a crisis. Remember, a crisis involves rolling 2d6. So I rolled an 11 and comparing that to the number of Urus you have in the mosque box. I have nine, you have to roll greater than or you fail. So if I rolled like a six, that's less than or equal to the number the game ends, the crisis takes over, and you lose. So you want to you wanna keep this number down to two or three, maybe four guys or urus in that box. Uh, never more than that. But occasionally you're going to get more. And frankly, you're going to have to take more and more risks 
as these higher valued mechs, the five valued mechs start converging on your capital of Soba. So I showed you the, the nobility, it moves down. These you can also use efforts to increase them. So you'll notice there are die symbols. So for instance, the army is in the three spot. To get to the four spot, I have to spend an effort. I have to roll a die. I get no bonuses. There are no bonuses to that die roll. I rolled a six. All you have to do is equal to or greater than. So I increase uh, the army value. Ignore these assets at your own peril. If you ignore them, you will lose the game just as fast as if you ignore uh, the mechs. You just can't ignore them. The other cool thing about the royal assets here is that when you get it into the sixth level, so let's say, yeah, I can just do that. Nobility's at a five, I roll a die, I'm trying to increase it. Oh, I rolled a four, I increase my nobility, and when you move into that sixth spot, you rotate. What that's going to do during the, I think it's called the cleanup phase, the turn in phase, BXF is what it, the symbol that's used there because you're going to get your bonuses, you're going to get defections, and then you're going to check the status of Faras, which is on the B track. We'll talk about that here in a moment. But what this is going to do at the beginning of the turn in phase, I can unrotate that to take one of those plus one feudalism markers and place it out anywhere on any track to modify rolls against that enemy. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it on the one track because I know I've gotta keep fighting uh, fighting this guy. Had it ended there, the game would have been over. Gotta keep fighting him off. So back to the cards. After all of those things, you're then going to do your efforts. You're gonna spend your efforts to increase your royal assets, fight off the mechs and try to drive them back. Uh, you're also going to use your very asset, various assets to get more efforts. You know, that's part of that game, managing those concepts. And then you go to the game turn or the turn in phase, which is referred to as BXF. And once again, that BXF stands for bonuses, like I talked about here. X is defections. These are X's on the map. And here, you're going to suffer those. If you have a token at the end of the turn, like these two there, you're literally going to draw an Uru at random from the draw cup, and you're going to lose him here to the mosque. They do compensate you for that, though. They give you a free action that you must use immediately. You can do anything with it. You can attack that mech. You can try to drive up one of these assets, etc. So you do that in strict order because let's say you lost. You have to do this green one first before this blue one. You have to take an Uru, put him in the box. You then get a free attack. What you might do is attack this blue guy to drive him back. You're going to have to roll a five or higher, actually four or higher, because you have a bonus there. Drive him back so that now he's not in the X spot and he doesn't create uh, defections for you. So then you're going to check Faras, and Faras is going to fall probably in the fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth turn. When that falls, typically what happens is the green mech changes from their easier four value, the Beja, to the cons, and they are harder because they're a five. So that's the basic of the game and the cards and how they work. Once again, game has 27 turns, so it's not overly long. I don't feel like it overstays its welcome. Once you learn the rules, literally a turn can be done in 45 to 60 seconds. So this game is going to play anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. You know, I, I think that fast playing games typically are uh, welcomed. I have a lot of games that are longer. In fact, on my table right now to the right off camera, you can't see it. I have Jeff Davis, the Confederacy at War set up from White Dog Games. That game's about a three-hour game because it has 44 different turns. They're very involved. You have a lot of actions, a lot of different things to do. This is a more succinct, quick-playing, interesting, quick-playing yet interesting game that I, I really enjoyed. I had a good time with this. So what else do I want to talk to you about? There's a lot of neat elements in this design. Uh, the royal assets are very cool. These six bonuses are very nice. 
There are Nubian archers for the army. If you ever get that marker to the highest level, you're going to gain what's called a Nubian archer. You're going to take that archer token and you're going to put it anywhere on a track. And if this mech, where the Nubian archer on the track that it, or the path that it is, moves, you're going to remove that Nubian archer and he will stay there as if you defeated him or stopped him. Those are harder to get, but they're very, very nice. Uh, on the kingship uh, asset, if you get it to the sixth level, you're going to get what's called an epark, who is kind of a, uh, a military man that's going to help you. You can put out one of their tokens. Here, I'll show you these tokens. Uh, it has a plus one or a minus one. So it just depends. You're going to put it out on a path. And while that token is there, you can use it to modify die rolls either higher or lower. More often than not, you're going to want to modify them up and you can hold on to it until you need it. So you might roll, know you needing a, need a four, you only roll a three. If you discard that E-Park, you're going to get an immediate plus one and you're going to drive that guy back. It also can be used for a negative one to that roll. Why would you do that, you say, on these paths? Well... There are things called monastery tiles, and you earn these by, by something negative happening to you. Anytime the kingship track goes down into this three space that you can see right there on camera, you're going to gain access to one of these tiles. These monastery tiles you place out anywhere on the board, and they act as a deterrent to try to keep that mech from moving. The number that's listed there is the number that the mech needs to roll lower than in order to move. Not equal to and lower than, but lower than. So this number here is a four. You're going to roll a die every time a mech, let's place it here. So when that cons mech is activated, you're going to have to roll a d6. Sorry, my arm went in front of the camera. On a roll of three or less, I rolled a two that cons is not going to move. That monastery is going to stay there. They are defending that area, and that Islam, or Muslim tribe cannot move. If they roll above, so if they roll a six, you're going to discard that monastery tile back. You're then going to draw an Uru and lose it. It's going to go to the mosque because that's a devastating thing, both to morale as well as the faith of the church and the faith of the people in you as their Uru. So you're going to earn that only when the kingship tile moves down. There are four of them. They are misprinted in the game unless they fix that since I received this copy. They are printed as four, five, five, and six. They should have been printed as two, three, three, and four. So three of the numbers are wrong. So the best one is the two one. If you can somehow get that one out on one of these bigger tribes, man, they're not going to be able to move very often. But knowing my luck, I'll roll a one on the first one and it'll get discarded and they will, they will be able to move. So this game, what does it boil down to? You're going to follow these cards. Very simple. You literally do exactly what the cards say. You're going to modify the paths on the board, moving the, the mechs up. You're then going to use your actions that you have earned, which are random. You know, you're going to draw those from these two cups. So that's a very interesting element. You're then going to use those efforts or actions, as I call them, to try to fight these paths back, keep your royal assets up, and, and defend your, uh, your kingdom. You have to last 27 rounds. Not an easy task. I won on my second play... And I still think, looking back on it, I did a couple of things wrong that probably would have made me lose the game. So frankly, it's a little harder than I thought it would be. But in my opinion, a good solitaire game should be difficult to win. You don't want to play it, destroy it, because then you won't have a challenge and you won't want to play it again. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about before I then kind of give my final thoughts, uh, the slaves. So in the slavery pool... There is a slaves token. And I, I actually admire the designer, Ben Madison, for including these elements into these games because it would be very easy just to whitewash it, 
not throw them in and you would still have a very interesting and playable uh, simulation. But I think the truth of the matter is these warring kingdoms all were different religious beliefs and they saw each other as enemies. When they attacked or fought or had the opportunity to enslave each other, take advantage of each other, take their, their resources so that their people could live, it's kind of survival of the fittest. That's what a lot of ancient civilizations did. It was about survival. So the slave token is there. When it is out and the shillok are the tribe that is represented on the blue, uh, the blue thing, you can see shillok here. And that's a different difference from the funj, who is the bigger tribe. Uh, Oh, the, the tribe that comes out later in the game, they have a better attack value, th five versus three. And you'll notice there's the shackle and chains on the shillik. When you as a player attack the shillik tribe and defeat them, pushing them back with one of your efforts, you gain this slave's token. It becomes a resource. As much as that is difficult for us to think about and say, it becomes a usable resource. The way that you use it is that any of the Muslim tribes, so I'm gonna show you the Muslim tribes, and then I will show you an example of a non-Muslim tribe. So I think the rules mention that the, the Shiliks were not Muslim, therefore their slaves were acceptable to the Muslims and could be used as a currency or in many ways a bribe to keep them from advancing and attacking you. So you'll notice the three mechs on the top, the Jad, the Khans, and the Kawahala, and then the, tri the tribe on the bottom, the Beja. The three on the top have their numbers in a white oval. That denotes that they are a Muslim tribe, and you can actually use this. Let me put them back on the board. You don't need him. Let's put the three there. I would never use it on the three. You can actually, when they move, so when they are ordered to move by the card, let's say the Jod are ordered to move, and I have this slavery token, or slaves token, I can discard it to stop them from moving. So it's kind of an uneasy truce uh, by using that as a resource. So once again, I want to reiterate my, my appreciation for the fact that that was included in the game Obviously not something we celebrate nor enjoy playing a game around or about, but I do believe it's important to represent those things because, frankly, if he had whitewashed the history, he probably would have received criticism for that as well. So I know in, in Jeff Davis, the Confederacy at War, slaves are included as a resource. I think that's a very progressive step to represent these times more appropriately by including those things in the game. So, in closing, I really enjoy this simulation. It's very interesting. There's a lot of neat elements. Um, it's an exercise in, frankly, managing your limited efforts. You're going to get somewhere between two and six efforts a turn if you're lucky. And you've really got to take advantage of those. You've got to try to get out these feudal tokens to make your rolls more effective against those, those mechs advancing on you. You can't just stand there and straight up roll because the reality on a D6, needing to roll a five or higher is not a good percentage. That's 33% chance of success. And I'm here to tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've rolled eight, seven or eight times in a row, ones, twos, and threes. And it just, it becomes very frustrating. And that's just part of the game. If it was guaranteed, it wouldn't be necessarily an interesting exercise. But you can mitigate those, those elements of luck, those elements of dice rolling by managing your resources, using your land sale tokens, using your princesses, and using your bishops. And frankly, I, I didn't talk necessarily about the mechanics of the prince, the crown prince, but... One time per turn, when you're attacking a mech, you can, you can reach in, draw a... Where's my... I've lost my Urus. 
Well, you can reach in, draw an Uru out. Oh, I, I just reached in and drew the two out. You then put it in the Uru box. You're going to attack a stack. There I need to roll a five or higher on that path, path C. But I roll it at a plus two modifier because the crown prince is leading the charge. So I go ahead and roll. I rolled a three. Plus two is a five. I equal the five and I'm going to push back uh, the cons. So he then is going to become your next king. So the next turn... When you draw the event and it tells you Uru and you're supposed to replace your king, you're actually going to just simply take the old king, put him back in the draw cup, and then he's going to be your new king. If I had lost, if I had rolled a, a two or lower, he would then go to that mosque, and maybe I showed you that, um, and he would be lost, making your crisis check that much more uh, chance of success and ending the game when that happens. So I, I really like this concept of managing your resources. I really like the States of Siege Siege system. I've played numerous States of Siege games. Uh, one of my favorites is Mound Builders, also by Ben Madison and Wes Ern Ernie. Just a great system because it's simple, generally very rules light, but creates an experience where you're trying to manage something and, and simply survive. So during the uh, end of the game, you're going to add up your glory points. I think they call them no Noki points. Uh, and they come from a variety of factors. It's the closest path is your multiplier, and you're going to multiply that times the number of lands you have. So the closest path here is one. I would then count the territories I own. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So one times eight, I'm going to get eight points. You get a couple of points for these in your box, your downtown Sobo box, if they are unused. Um, and you're going to come up with a final score somewhere between 10 and 50. 50 means you did amazing. Uh, anything at less than that is a victory, but it's a Pyrrhic vic victory uh, that, that is not going to serve you well and most definitely puts Nubia in danger of being invaded again and or taken over by other kingdoms. So this really is a fight to the death. It is a defense of your culture as Nubia and really is an interesting game. Really enjoy the different aspects. And frankly, it's a fun game. 30 to 60 minutes, it plays very quickly. You can actually play half the cards, leave and do something, and then come back and finish it up. And it, it doesn't lose its interest or its, its excitement. And frankly, near the end of the game, it gets very tense. It is very hard to survive. And man, when you're there, you're kind of like, oh, I've only got three or four cards left. I can do this. And inevitably, something bad comes up. There are some cards in that deck that are good for you, but very, very few of them are good for you. Most of them are bad. Most of them are difficult. And that's what makes, makes it an interesting uh, game in and of itself, just because it's, it's hard. It's not easy. So that is Nubia, Egypt's Black Heirs. I would give this game pretty high marks. I think it's an interesting one. I think most of you should have it in your collections. I think it's one that you'll enjoy playing. Uh, but it is not my favorite States of Siege game. There are other ones that I do enjoy uh, more. Uh, Habsburg Eclipse is one that comes to mind. Ottoman Sunset. Um, Dawn of the Zeds is really interesting uh, from Victory Point Games. You can do that solo or cooperative. It's a States of Siege game. But this one is very good, and it's on a topic that I don't know that I've ever played a game on before. So that's a good thing because it's a good learning experience. So that's been my thoughts on Nubia, Egypt's Black Airs from White Dog Games, designed by Ben Madison. I might put together a playthrough on this, uh, but it's going to be a 30-minute to an hour-long video, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, but those are my thoughts. I appreciate you watching. I've been Grant for the Player's Aid.